Now we want to discuss the nature of journalism and your role in it. And of course, given present circumstances, we're not discussing this until we all get together. So here I want to offer some ideas and challenges in the hopes that you'll challenge me back and challenge each other in our discussion. I'm going to give you, I'll warn you, a lot of long lists of ideas to talk about. And so please take notes about what you want to disagree with, where you think I'm wrong, what you think I've missed when we do get to discuss this. I want to start with three ideas of mine, beliefs of mine, to set the stage. First, the internet is not media. We in media tend to look at the world godlike in our image and think everyone wants to be us. So we called the internet a third medium after print and broadcast because to us, it looked like that. It looked like text and stories and so on. But no, the internet is something new. I see it as a connection machine that connects people with information, people with each other, information with information, machines with machines. So rather than the net being a subset of media, I, th I think the opposite is true. Media are a subset of the net along with other sectors of society being drawn into its black hole gravity. Communications is now entirely inside the net. So-called social media started inside. Education was very slowly being drawn inside the net, but of course COVID sped, sped up that process quite a bit. Same with retail. Other sectors are being drawn in as well. Finance, government, even crime. So I find studying the internet more interesting than studying just media or even journalism. And that gives you as journalists a much broader canvas to work from. When you ask how to serve communities, you no longer have just one tool to answer with, the story in the publication as content. Now you can imagine endless means to serve the public. The second idea, death to the mass. The mass, as a term, treats everyone the same as the great none of the above. It's often synonymous with the words, the mob. It is dismissive, paternalistic, insulting, and ultimately, I believe, racist. It is a sign of the belief that I was raised with that we lived in a great melting pot, that we would all end up acting the same, that is to say, like the majority, and erase our own identities. That is the worldview around this idea of the mass. Raymond Williams, a sociologist, said this, the masses are always the others whom we don't know and can't know. There are, in fact, no masses. There are only ways of seeing people as masses. John Kerry said this, its function is to eliminate the human status of the majority of people. He says the mass is a metaphor for the unknowable and invisible. We cannot see the mass. Crowds can be seen. But the mass is the crowd in its metaphysical aspect, the sum of all possible crowds. The mass is a myth that forms the basis of mass media's business model, and we'll talk about that in the next video. But here comes the internet. And what it does more than anything else, in my view, is that it kills the myth of the mass. It lets people identify as they wish to identify, to find each other online, to assemble, and to act as themselves. I think that moving past Gutenberg's containers, in the parenthesis, allows people to make their own containers, their own definitions of themselves. And I wonder whether this opens up society at last to fluid definitions of gender identity and community identity and personal identity. So please beware talking about a single monolithic public, a mass. Recognize the individuality, the identity, the community, the humanity within. John Dewey quoted the philosopher Thomas Carlyle saying, invent the printing press and democracy is inevitable. To which Dewey said, add to this, invent the railways, the telephone, mass manufacture and concentration of population in urban centers and some form of democratic government is, humanly speaking, inevitable. Is he right? Marshall McLuhan said, print technology created the public. Electric technology created the mass. Well, then I'll ask, what does the internet create? That's what we're trying to decide. Here's my answer, idea number three. Society is a conversation. So should journalism be. 
I want to quote James Carey, not John Carey, not to be confused here. James Carey was a legendary journalism professor at Columbia and a philosopher, really. And he said this, Republics require conversation, often cacophonous conversation, for they should be noisy places. Isn't that beautiful? Because that's exactly what we're seeing happen right now. A controlled conversation is suddenly opened up to a lot more people who can speak and be heard. They always spoke, they just couldn't be heard. And now they can find each other and they can act and join together in all kinds of ways. And that creates to some people noise. But that noise is democracy. It is us trying to relearn the conversation. It is voices being heard at last. I celebrate that. Kerry said, that conversation has to be informed, of course, and the press has a role in supplying that information. But the kind of information required can be generated only by public conversation. There is simply no substitute for it. We have virtually no idea what it is we need to know until we start talking to someone. I would add, until we start listening. Kerry continues. The task of the press is to encourage the conversation of the culture, not to preempt it or substitute for it or supply it with information as a seer from afar. Here, let me interrupt Kerry and talk about Jay Rosen, my friend at New York University. He talks about the view from nowhere. The journalists try to act almost not human. They try to put themselves apart from communities and say that we have somehow a different way to see communities, a higher level. Well, that separates us from those communities. And that, says Kerry and Rosen, is dangerous. Kerry continues, rather, the press maintains and enhances the conversation of the culture, becomes one voice in that conversation, amplifies the conversation outward, and helps it along by bringing forward the information that the conversation itself demands. God, I love that. I'm going to read it again. Kerry said, the press maintains and enhances the conversation of the culture. That's our primary job, to ensure a good conversation. The press becomes one voice in that conversation. We are not above it. We are part of it. The press amplifies the conversation outward. I'll talk in a few minutes about our need to amplify voices. And the press helps it along by bringing forward the information that the conversation itself demands. Ah, that's the journalism we know, right? Information supplied to the public. But how to the public? To the public's conversation. In the next take, I'll, tape, I'll talk about a um, company called Spaceship Media that I think does that. So, the internet connects us. It lets us restart the conversation that was lost sometime after Gutenberg. Martin Luther used print to hold conversations and disputations with his fellow theologians. Montaigne used print to hold conversations with friends of the world. I think that steam and the penny press and mass media killed that ability in media, and now we get to restore it. But how? What is a quality conversation? What's our role in it? One more time from James Carey. He said, we must turn to the task of creating a public realm in which free people can assemble, speak their minds, and then write or tape or otherwise record the extended conversation so that others out of sight might see it. If the established press wants to aid that process, so much the better. But if, in love with profits and tied to corporate interests, the press decides to sit out public life, we shall simply have to create a space for citizens and patriots by ourselves. Well, that sounds to me much like Twitter, or at least the promise of Twitter. But it was written 15 years before Twitter was created. And that is to say that newspapers could have created Twitter, or Facebook, or Friendster, or MySpace, or Reddit, or Nextdoor, or any of these as mechanisms for public conversation but they didn't. I believe they didn't because they don't value conversation. They value content. And this is why news needs and is ripe for reinvention. Now that's the essence of the philosophy behind social journalism I'll mention here for just a minute. Journalism as service to communities and their conversations. In Social J, we start not with content, but with co communities. Social J students, you will find a community that is self-identified, not with an external definition such as millennial. That's bullshit. None of you comes up and says, hi, I'm a millennial. 
and, and by the way, what I just did is anachronistic itself because we're not going to shake hands anymore. But anyway, first, as Social J students, you're going to observe, listen to, understand, empathize with, and reflect back to a community what you've learned to make sure you get it right. Then you can decide what of the many tools of journalism you may bring to that community to help it meet its goals. This is journalism as listening, journalism as service. And that is my perspective on journalism. That's why I mention this now. So let's go and review now the elements of journalism from Kovach and Rosenstiel, the book you read, which in some ways is seen as traditional, but in some ways is quite enlightened, for it has so many of these ideas in it. Let's just explore the, the 10 elements pretty quickly. Number one, journalism's first obligation is to the truth. Okay, but define truth. Is it merely facts? Is it a higher level judgment? Kellyanne Conway talked presciently about alternative facts, and tragically, she was right. People do have their alternative facts. Dana Boyd, a brilliant researcher here in New York, says that we are in an epistemological war. That is, if I don't like you, I'm not going to like your facts. Of course, that makes no sense, but that's the world we're in right now that makes little sense. What do we do about that? This is a very challenging time to sell truth. The second element, its first loyalty is to citizens. I salute that flag, but I will quibble with the word citizen as a bit loaded. So perhaps the public to include immigrants. But I don't want to find myself in the trap of identifying one public, a mass. So maybe just its loyalty is to people or communities. The third, its essence is a discipline of verification, also yes. But we've learned that fact-checking is not sufficient. The truth is hard. See how Facebook has brought in fact-checkers like crazy and has it really helped? The verification is absolutely a key skill. You will learn much from Barbara Gray and her colleagues. And, and, and then you'll see what else is needed on top of that so that we can get people to believe the facts. Fourth, its practitioners must maintain an independence from those they cover. Amen. Access is a disease in journalism. Your job is to serve people, not sources. Beware it is hypnotizing to think that you're going to have know things that other people don't know. You're going to have access to people other people don't have access to. Don't let that draw you in. Number five. Journalism must serve as an independent monitor of power. Amen again. If we could do only one job as journalists, holding power to account is it. But of course, we have other jobs to do as well. Number six, journalism, journalism must provide a forum for public criticism and compromise. I very much agree, and you'll soon hear my definition of journalism and how it fits that well. This is about the conversation. Number seven, it must strive to keep the significant is interesting and relevant. Now, here I want to quibble. Our desire to make things interesting is what leads to sensationalism, to the belief that we need to sex up a story to get attention and traffic. It is a problem of the attention-based business model that we'll talk about in the next video. Number eight, journalism must keep the news comprehensive and proportional. We tend to call that news judgment, and yes, that's vital. But news judgment comes out of a black box like an algorithm, or in the case of newsrooms, call it a white box that is too often too opaque. and We don't really know what the judgments are made and who makes them based on what lived experience. You're going to hear once in a while when you go out in the field, an editor say to you when you come in with a story idea from a community, they're going to say, that's not big enough. Not enough people care. Well, argue back. Because if you've done your job well, You've, you've heard the concerns of people. And just because it is not in the lived experience of the editor, who has a position of privilege, and just because it comes from a smaller community, doesn't mean that it's not news and not important to those people and not worth your time to cover. So be ready to argue that not everything in news has to be big. News judgment is not about getting the most traffic and the most time and the most attention. News judgment is about serving communities. Uh, number nine, I'm almost there. Journalism's practitioners must be allowed to exercise their personal conscience. Well, I agree with that, but that's pretty controversial. 
Right? Look how at the New York Times, when the op-ed page ran its op-ed by Tom Cotton, the staff violated the social media rules of the Times to protest because it mattered to them. They were actually risking their careers in that, and they did it as a collective, and they had impact. They spoke their personal conscience. And number 10, citizens too have rights and responsibilities when it comes to the news. Yes, again. But I'm, I'm wary of the idea of calling this media literacy. There's a lot of talk about that. If people just were literate about media, everything would be okay. Uh, this is a heresy of mine, but I believe that if, if journalism requires a user's manual, we're probably doing it wrong. And it's not about making the public more media literate. It's about making the media more public literate so we can speak the same language. So I think in the end, yes, they're right that the, we get the internet and society we deserve. Everyone bears responsibility. Every time you or your friends link to something that is mean or wrong, then you have a responsibility. That's how you're building the future and you should build a better future. So that's their 10. What do they leave out? What do they get wrong? This is up to you to answer, not me. I have my ideas about the roles and goals of journalism. So here's a lightning round of possible roles of the journalist to talk about. First, to inform. Yes, of course, but who and with what? That's an easy beginning. Next, to be a storyteller. Yes, most people salute that flag and I will too, but I wanna emphasize that storytelling is but one tool. And the danger of the story is that we control the narrative and who is represented in it. You will learn here to write good stories, but just don't let it go to your heads. And by the way, when you leave this week, don't accuse me to other professors of saying I'm killing the story. I'm not, all right? Next, the idea of service, which I talked about. I believe we need to look at journalism first as a service, not as a factory that makes a product called content to fill publications to sell. Service necessarily starts with the community and its goals and its needs, and the community then judges whether or not we have helped them fulfill those goals and needs. Content fills things, services accomplish things. So then we move to intellectual honesty. Now, when I say that we should listen to the public we serve, I don't mean we just give them what they want and that's all. And the argument then that I hear from people is, well, if we give them what they want, then we'll only give them sex and crime. That's condescending, patronizing. Instead, this is the idea that we have to serve both the truth and the community, and that means oftentimes we, we must tell the community uncomfortable truths. The Guardian's motto has been to be the world's leading liberal voice. Well, how does that square with the journalism we teach? I asked Alan Rusberger, the former editor of The Guardian, and he said it's we bring intellectual honesty. We report those things that don't necessarily square up with what the world we want to be, but the world as it is. Next, advocate. Well, that's a big one. Are we advocates? Well, when I say yes, I might get myself shot against the school wall dawn, but good thing I'm not there right now. Uh, I think we've always been advocates for truth, for justice, for fairness, for the little guy against power. Lewis Raven Wallace says that we can be advocates, but not partisans. What do you think? Next, investigators or watchdogs. Many will argue, and I will agree, this is the central value of journalism, the thing we most must preserve and protect and support. But let me just add this. Not everything in journalism is a scandal. There are scandals to be found, and we're likely to be the ones to find them. We hold power to account. We try to answer the questions that aren't being asked. But if we look at everything we see with a jaundiced, cynical eye, are we really presenting an accurate and fair view of the world? There's a movement in Europe called constructive journalism that argues that we've got to present a more accurate picture of what life is really like, and it's not all hell, though that's hard to believe these days. There's also a movement uh, in, in the U.S. out of New York called solutions journalism, that doesn't propose solutions, but that argues that one of our jobs is to tell people after a problem, what can they do about it? Those are different ways to think of ourselves and how we present the world. The next idea, transparency. One way to think of journalism is that we serve an ethic of openness, that is to say transparency. We expect governments and corporations to be transparent and we force it out of them. We use our power for that good end. But this means we must also be transparent about our mechanisms and means, our biases and experiences, our own conflicts of interest. 
we must hold ourselves to the highest standards of transparency, and often newsrooms don't. Next idea, collaborators. We're not very good at collaborating in journalism. We like our exclusives, our scoops. Paradoxically, we like secrets when they're ours, but we cannot continue that. We must work together as news organizations as we now live in a larger ecosystem and we cannot afford anymore to go it alone. Much more important, we must collaborate with the public as partners as the net provides so many means to do so. So when you look at the public, see how you're gonna help them and they're gonna help you in that order. Next, we're conveners. If journalism is a conversation, then much of our job should be to help convene communities into conversation and help them improve that conversation. They don't always need us to do that. They can do it on their own in plenty of places, but sometimes they do. And I also think we need to convene communities together, perhaps sometimes to bring peace among them, or at least understanding. In our fractious world today, what we need most, I believe, is the ability to make strangers less strange to disarm the idea of the other. Journalism, I think, should make that its aim. I wish Facebook and Twitter would also make that their aims. Next idea. Do we set the agenda? No, I hate this one. It's so paternalistic to think that we know the public's agenda. It's also why I so dislike the habit of political journalists to predict when prediction does nothing to inform the voting public. It's why I hate polls. One more time to James Carey. Public life started to evaporate with the emergence of the public polling industry and the apparatus of polling, he said. Polling was an attempt to simulate public opinion in order to prevent an authentic public opinion from forming. What he's saying there is the pollster does indeed set the agenda by setting the questions, and that feeds into the desire of the predictors, but it's not a good way to listen to the true desires and needs of a nuanced public. Next idea, amplifier. I like this one all the more. And I think that's what I've learned more than anything in the COVID-19 crisis. Early on, I started a COVID Twitter list of experts, uh, epidemiologists, virologists, public uh, health officials, um, geneticists, biologists, a few journalists. If you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash COVID Twitter list, again, that's bit.ly slash COVID Twitter list, you'll find my 600 experts and they're amazing. And, and I realized that in this crisis versus the last crisis after the American presidential election, there we thought our enemy was disinformation, misinformation, trolls, and bots. Well, now our enemy is more ignorance, people who don't know the value of wearing masks, people who don't know the value of vaccines. And so how do we fight ignorance? We fight it as we always have in journalism with expertise. Now, our role used to be to go find the expert and quote them. We decided who the experts were and we decided whom to quote. Well, now they don't need us to an extent. They have Twitter. And they've used it in incredible ways. They have used preprint servers to share data and information in the COVID crisis. They have used Twitter to do peer review of those papers to find out what's good and bad in them. They use Twitter to talk to the public and to journalists to explain what's going on. We have a lot of lessons to learn from them and they in turn want us to help amplify their voices. But of course, those aren't the only voices to amplify. More importantly still is the voices who for too long have not been heard in mainstream mass media. It is our responsibility now to work hard to find voices and to listen and to amplify those voices that we think deserve to be heard more. It, it is surprisingly not hard to do on Twitter to find fascinating voices from communities you don't know. So when you go out on your assignment, which we'll, we'll send you in an email, I want you to try hard to find those voices whom you want to listen to and amplify. The next role, educators. Are we as journalists educators? Well, there is a little danger there that we set the curriculum for the public. But surely, again, when it comes to face masks and virology and vaccinations, we must do a better job of informing, educating the public. Are we just explainers? Maybe. But as educators, we would take responsibility for the outcomes of a lesson. That's what educators do. Did the public learn that face masks are beneficial? If they didn't, what do we do so that they can learn that because we know it's beneficial? Also, being educators helps us borrow from other fields in the academe. 
If communities aren't getting along, what can we learn from anthropology? If people aren't accepting facts, what can we learn from neuroscience, neuroscience or psychology as to why? And so on. So I encourage you, who come from many different fields, to bring your experience from those other fields and your majors in college to your journalism work. I think we in journalism have much to learn from other fields. Finally, my last, objectivity. Save the big one, the tough one, for last. The reason we assigned you Wesley Lowry's essay and Lewis Raven's Wallace's book is that we want to have a robust discussion about this, and it is right in the heart of the news and the news industry at the moment. They argue against objectivity as a moray of journalism, and I will too. But I want to make clear that you shouldn't be intimidated by me sitting up here in videos talking to you. You should feel free to argue with them and with me. I've seen objectivity as a mass, as a, rather as a myth, as it denies our own humanity and biases. I agree with Lowry and Wallace that objectivity is a cog in a machine of systemic control. For it's the people in power who decide what is objective. And those people, well, we know what they look like, too often like me. So what is your North Star for journalism? What are your goals? Why are you here? What roles do you want to play? Remember that the tools you'll learn, writing, web video, podcasting, investigation, photography, data, coding, are tools to an end. But you have to decide what that end is. So now I'd like to quote from some of the definitions of journalism that you provided in the forms I sent out. One more list. It's fearless and it's honest. It's the first draft of history. It is the truth that everyone needs. It is the lifeblood of the powerless when and if it speaks truth to power. That's pretty lovely. I like that. Next. Journalism is the recognition, distillation, and distribution of what happens in the world. It is the first draft of history. Well, we have that again. The journalist must remain a neutral observer no matter how much impartiality eats you up. Oh, we're going to have a great discussion about objectivity right there. Next. Journalism is the delivery of pertinent and relevant information to a local or national population. Journalism should keep all people accountable for their actions, bring a spotlight on injustices, and educate readers on events that affect their lives. Good journalism will save lives. Well, saving lives is a high bar indeed and a definition of service that I can get behind, especially in this time. Whether the story is the pandemic or whether the story is racism in policing or whether the story is uh, guns in neighborhoods or whether the story is poverty. Saving lives is part of what we should do. I like that one too. Next. Journalism is the tool used to share stories with others so that we as a collective can be informed of what is happening within communities both near and far. Journalism allows for the honest human experience to be shared and is a gateway for connection and change. That goes to my social journalism heart. I don't know whether the student who wrote it uh, is in the Social J program, but it's about, about sharing people's experiences, making strangers less strange, connecting, and also about changing. Next. I define journalism as being the unofficial fourth branch of government. I believe that the true purpose of journalism is to check all the other branches of government and its politicians so that their constituents and the masses as a whole receive the absolute truth in every story. The ethical responsibility of the journalist is to find the important stories, do the hard research, ask the tough questions, and release the undeniable facts to the public. I look forward to discussing that one too. Next, journalism is a voice for the people. It allows those not in charge to express their opinions for many to read and hear. That's the role of the amplifier. Next. A lot of people like to think of journalism as this unbiased voice. But because journalism is made up of humans, it is bound to be full of instances of unconscious bias. There is another good discussion. That's the essence of the discussion about objectivity. Next. Consciously or unconsciously, everyone can end up practicing journalism, from a professional reporter to a gossiper. And I would add many things in between. One of the discussions we might have, too, is who's a journalist? Or does it even matter who's a journalist? Maybe the better discussion is, what is an act of journalism? How can people contribute to a larger ecosystem of information doing whatever it is they do that brings value? Next, 
Since knowledge is power, journalism, in essence, is the pursuit of the truth to empower the public. That's nice and concise. I like that. Next, I define journalism as gathering information to distribute to others for the greater good. They convey information as a service to help others. There's a North Star. Finally, journalism is more than just reporting the facts. It is about, it is about serving your community's well-being and interests. It is about being thorough and accurate. Amen. It is about timely and impactful events. It is also about ideally crafting a compelling and interesting story. Without an informed citizenry, our system doesn't function. So now, after all of that, finally, I'm going to share with you my definition of journalism. As I like to say, I have tenure, so I can do obnoxious things like re redefine journalism. But I wanted to have an idea of the mission of journalism that informs my thinking. And it's informed by everything you've heard so far, by James Carey, by the work of, of Carey Brown and Social J, by the students in Social J that I've learned from, by the students throughout the school and lived experiences there. So here's my definition of journalism, my mission for journalism. To convene communities into respectful, informed, and productive conversation. Informed is in that sandwich. It's the primary part of our job, yes, but if we're not respectful with each other, if we can't understand each other, does it mean anything to get the facts? Are we going to get anywhere? And productive is necessary too, because if all we do is report crime for the sake of reporting crime, why? What does that accomplish? What are we here to do with our precious resources? So there, very long spiel of many, many ideas, and I know I missed a lot. So I want you to please bring in more ideas to our discussion when we're together and throughout the next year and a half of your life at Newmark. And next, in the last video for me, we'll look at the business of journalism and how we got here and how you can support building innovation in new ways. Thanks again for your attention.